Hello, everybody. Welcome to part 12 of our study of the return of the Divine Sophia. Hopefully, this week's section, which is chapter 15, The Lost Teachings of Jesus, will not be a shit show like the last week's section was. That was the first time I've ever had to just call a reading because the information was just so inaccurate. Again, as I said last week, it's not that I have a different opinion. It's just that what she had written in that last week's chapter regarding Mary and the divine feminine was just not accurate. It was just not true information. And so I called the reading and we're going to start again with chapter 15. I've, I've loved every chapter up to last week's chapter. So let's just hope that last week's chapter was a little bit of just a one-off. And um, I apologize if you hear some banging going on. They are doing very intense construction next door there used to be a restaurant next to me and they tore the restaurant down and they're building high rises right now which who in the hell can afford a high rise i don't know but it's very annoying it's been going on for a while it probably will continue to go on for a while so if you hear that banking i do apologize there's nothing i can do about it so it just is what it is so let's go ahead and get started on chapter 15 which is the lost teachings of jesus in my book this is page 295 Every soul is immortal. All that is soul presides over all that is without soul and patrols all heaven, now appearing in one form and now another. Every man's soul has by the law of his birth been a specter of eternal truth or it would never have passed into our mortal frame. Yet still, it is no easy matter for all to be reminded of their past by their present experience. And that, of course, was written by Plato, who lived from 427 to 347 BCE. I, of course, am a huge lover of Plato. I speak about Plato a lot on this channel. As I began to enter more deeply into the hidden mysteries of the goddess, I found myself wanting to know what Jesus had to say about the Divine Mother. After all, if Jesus, or Yahshua, was a fully realized God being, then certainly he would have known about the Holy Mother. And when she says a fully realized God being, she's saying that he conquered his own self. He became what we called enlightened. The word savior means to not have to incarnate again. It doesn't mean someone that's going to come save you. Yahshua or Jesus was a man. He was not a dim. We're all demigods. We're all, we all have the Christ inside of us. They decided to make Yahshua a man or Jesus a man at the council of Nicaea from Constantine, who was a Satanist. So if you're a Christian and that triggers you, I just beg you to please do your research. Look up the council of Nicaea with Constantine. Look up the council. Sorry, that was my alarm reminding me to do something with filming. Anyway, <laughs> uh, look up the council of Nicaea. Look up Constantine. He was a total Satanist. Okay, so if you think Yahshua or Jesus was a god that came to earth to save you, you are following on a Luciferian path. Yahshua, the Christ, and Magdalene were teachers. They were here to teach you how to guru, how to transmute darkness to light for yourself as all of our souls are fractals of the divine. So when she said God being, she's saying that he had transmuted and had understood his own soul. So I began to look for key pieces from Jesus's lost teaching that may have been hidden in the Christian thought. And it was not long before I realized that many of the essential teachings of Jesus or Yahshua had been excised by the church authorities. Archdeacon Wilberforce of Westminster Abbey writes about the early corruptions of our known Gospels. After the Council of Nicaea, which I just spoke about, in 325 AD, the manuscript of the New Testaments were considered tampered with. If you still think the Bible that you have is the Word of God, then you are still dead asleep. You are still a sheep. Even this what this archdeacon is telling you, the manuscripts of the New Testament were tampered with. They were edited. They were changed. The stories were changed. All right, let's start again. After the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD, the manuscripts of the New Testament were considered tampered with. Professor Nessel, in his introduction to the textual criticism of the Greek Testament, tells us that certain scholars called correctors were appointed by the ecclesiastical authorities and commissioned to correct the text of scripture in the interests of what we consider orthodoxy. The orthodox correctors took great care to edit 
out any teachings from the gospel that they did not want the Christians to follow. Your Bible is censored. Just like social media censors, so does your Bible. They're one and the same. Wake up. Wake up. Wake up. The indoctrination and programming for the Christian faith is one of the reasons why we still haven't flipped yet. The church is, a, Christianity is a form of Satanism. It just is. Fact. It just is. It's not the teachings of Yahshua. It's not at all the teachings of Yahshua. Who you worship and praise is Mithra. Not Yahshua, it's Mithra. Look up Mithraism. So in the next few chapters, let's take a look at some of these excise teachings, which fall into three main categories. Reincarnation and karma as a mechanism for soul development. The importance of showing kindness to animals and the existence of the Divine Mother, a subject that deserves a chapter all on its own. The path of the soul through time. Today, most people do not realize that the concept of reincarnation is still a worldwide belief held by billions of people around the globe. Absolutely. In the West, statistics show that the people who embrace this belief are usually affluent, well-traveled, and educated professionals. That's not a lie. I embrace this belief. I'm very well traveled and I am a professional. The belief in reincarnation has been central to many great world cultures, including those of the Sumerians, the Egyptians, the Hindus, the Persians, the Greeks, the Romans, the Buddhists, and of course the Druids. Evidence of this philosophy has been discovered among the Scythians, Africans, and Pacific Islanders, as well as native tribes of North and South and Central America. It was deeply woven into the early centuries of Christian, Jewish, and Islamic belief. Absolutely. All the, the missing gospels constantly talk about reincarnation over and over and over again. Hell, the Bible you have, as edited as it is, you still see signs of reincarnation. This was absolutely taught by Yahshua. It's necessary. You are not, to not believe in reincarnation means that you are falling for your ego means that you believe your false sense of self is what's real and that is going to cause your human suffering when you die the body you live in goes back into the earth so what remains is your soul what does the soul do it then creates an expression for the next avatar to go through more lessons that you have to learn so the soul can know itself the thread of firm belief in rebirth has woven its long web unbroken from the dawn of time to the pragmatic present it has been circled the, it has circled the earth again and again touched nation after nation leaving no one considered also that it has never been upheld by a bigoted nor by agencies of persecution but invariably by the educated and open-minded the wise the good and the mystical that's interesting so people who typically what she's saying generally people who believe in reincarnation are really good people they're not people who are violent they're not people who want to hurt anybody else and we know statistically that the christian church is, the christian faith is the most violent faith on the face of the earth i mean statistically there is more blood on the christian faith than any other religion including that of the official church of satan so that speaks volumes doesn't it reincarnation in jewish and muslim teachings at the time of jesus or yahshua reincarnation was an accepted part of hebrew theology and was included in the christian canon for the first five centuries of, the, of its existence and i'm just going to verify again for you guys the real yahshua was not jewish he was egyptian but a lot of his students were jewish josephus the jewish historian writes that it writes that it was a doctrine of both the pharisees and the Essenes, and was part of the original jewish belief both Kabbalists and Hasidic Jews tell us that every person has a divine spark and prison inside of him and that man's destiny is to liberate the divine spark and, as scholar Ben Zion Boxker puts it, to unite with the large unity of creation and creator. The Jewish philosopher Philio of Alexander taught reincarnation at the time of Yahshua between 20 BCE and 50 BCE, as did the Chaldean Jewish sage Halil, the leading Pharisee in Jerusalem in the late 1st century BCE. Pythagoras, Plato, Pontus, Senencia, Ciro, Ovid, Virgil, and Marco Bias all transcribed to reincarnation, and these Greek philosophers' teachings lie at the heart of Western civilization. Reincarnation is also part of the Zohar, a Kabbalist text from 800 CE, written by Rabbi Simeon ben 
Yochia, I hope I'm saying that right. All souls are subject to trials of transmigration, he says, before both before coming into this world and then when they leave it. Souls must re-enter the absolute substance whence they have emerged. And if they are not fulfilled this condition during one life, they must commence another, a third, and so forth, until they have acquired acquired the conditions with which fits them to reunite with God. The belief or the doctrine of transmigration of souls is a firm and infallible dogma accepted by the whole assemblage of our church with one accord, so that there is none to be found who would dare to deny it. Indeed, there are great numbers of sages in Israel who hold firm to this doctor, doctrine, a fundamental point of our religion. So the truth of it is that the truth of it has been in contestably demonstrated by the Zohar and all the books of the Kabbalist. In Islam, reincarnation is the core tenet taught by Muhammad himself. Here are just a few quotes from the Quran. God generates beings and sends them back over and over again till they return to him. God is the one who created you all, then provided you substance, then will cause you to die, and then will bring you to life. How can you make denial of Allah who made you live again when you died and will make you dead again and then alive again until you finally return to him? Many famous philosophers, artists, and scientists have embraced this philosophy, including Immanuel Swedenborg, Immanuel Kant, Frederick Jacobi, Arthur Sch Schopenhauer, Gotthold Lessing, Johann Hinder, David Hume, and Wolfgang von Goethe. This belief can be found in the writings of Benjamin Franklin, Frederick the Great, Carl Jung, Ralph Waldo Emerson, and Napoleon Bonaparte. Henry Ford, the America and Industrial Road, when I discovered reincarnation, it was as if I had found a universal plan. I like that. Let me read that again. When I discovered reincarnation, it was as if I had found a universal plan. I realized that there was a chance to work out my ideas. Time was no longer limited. I was no longer a slave to the hands of a clock. I would like to communicate to others the calmness that the long view of life gives us. Some of the most famous writers and philosophers of the last three centuries have embraced this concept, including American novelist and poet Lu Louisa May Alcott, the British novelist Ald Aldous Huxley, and the Irish poet W.B. Yeats. This illust illustrious list also includes British novelist Rudyard Kipling, the English poet William Wordsworth, John Keats, and Percy Shelby and Alfred Lord Tenson, the poet of Britain. Reincarnation was embraced by French novelists Henri de Balzac, Gustave Flaubert, and Victor Hugo, as well as the American poet Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, Dave, Henry David Thoreau, and Walt Whitman. Honestly, I don't know why she had to include all those people in there to prove a point. I don't know, maybe to show you that it's a more common belief system than not, which I already knew that. I think most people actually believe in reincarnation. I don't. And just because all of these people believe something doesn't mean you should necessarily believe something. So I kind of think including all those names was a bit beside the point. Anyway, reincarnation and Jesus. Today, most Christians do not realize that in the first 500 years of Christianity, reincarnation was central to its teachings and was even taught by the early church fathers Clement of Alexandria, Justin Martyr, St. Jerome, St. Gregory of Nyssa, St. Augustine, St. John, so forth and so forth and so forth. I actually knew that when I first started studying reincarnation seriously. My grandmother, my dad's mother, believed in reincarnation. She played the piano and the organ at church, but she absolutely believed in reincarnation. So I was very familiar with this coming from her. She would talk about it a lot to us as kids. But when I first started taking it seriously, I was in college and I started reading a lot of Dave Weiss's books, uh, Many Minds, Many Masters, all that kind of stuff. And I actually, in my own research at college, discovered that the first part of the Christian church taught reincarnation and that's when i realized they say they stopped teaching reincarnation in order to teach fear so that we would give more money to the church in order to buy our way into heaven so i already knew this about the christian church i have i'm, I'm almost 40 now so for like 20 years i've known this so if this is new to you no yeah for the first like 500 years of christianity they very much taught reincarnation absolutely yashua taught it all right. It's absolutely necessary that the soul should be healed and purified. And if this does not take place during its life on earth, it must be accomplished in future lives. 
yeah, if you can't go through your karma now, you're going to have to come back and go through it another life. Orgian considered the great philosopher, a biblical scholar of his day, wrote books for the church about reincarnation, saying the soul is immaterial and invisible in nature, and at one time puts off one body and exchanges it for a second. Every soul comes into the world strengthened by the victories or weakened by the defeats of its previous life. His books also include chapters on the subtle levels of dimension and angels, his own era, or in his own era, Orgian was considered a saint, but three centuries after his death, he was excommunicated for heresy. Reincarnation simply did not fit into the church's policy anymore. Orgian's words, reprinted, reprinted below, mirror Yahshua's own. It is not more in conformity with reason that every soul, for certain mysterious reasons, is introduced into a body and introduced according to its de des deserts and former actions. The soul, which is not physical and it is invisible in its nature, exists in no material plane without a physical body suited to the nature of that place. Accordingly, it, it at times puts off one body, which was necessary before, but which is no longer adequate in its changed state, and it exchanges it for the second. While today most people are blithely unaware that these teachings were included in our Bible, traces of these teachings still remain. Remember when the apostles speaking about the John, John the Baptist asked, is he Elijah come again? I've pointed this out too. It's in your Bible, guys. If reincarnation wasn't taught, then why would the apostles be asking Yahshua if John the Baptist was the reincarnate of Elijah? Riddle me that, Batman. Common sense sometimes ain't so common. They're talking about reincarnation. They wanted to know if John the Baptist was the reincarnate of Elijah the prophet. Yahshua answered, I tell you that Elijah has come and they have treated him as they pleased. That's from Mark 9, 13. There is also the incident when Yahshua heals a man who had been blind since birth. The apostles ask, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And Jesus answers saying, neither. This man nor his parents sinned but that the works of God should be revealed in him. That's John 9, 1 through 3. Since the man had been blind at birth, he could not have sinned unless it was a carryover from a past life. Gnostic Christian Malachi writes, You do not live one life but many. Your soul passes from one life to the next until it fulfills its divine destiny. You have not come into the world for the sake of the world, but for the development and evolution of your soul. Yes, so your soul can know itself. You are not here for the goods of the world. You are not here to be the best damn accountant you can be or to have the multi-million dollar mansion in the swimming pool. You are here for your soul to know itself. Being the accountant, having the multi-million dollar mansion might be on the path of your soul knowing itself, but it's not the point. It's just the lesson. The challenge in entering into the world is to remember why you have come and to remain undistracted so that you might accomplish the purpose for which you have come, your dharma. The world is a dark darkness wrapped in glittering lights and the power of ignorance and forgetfulness is strong in it. But the true light is within you and it is the extension of this light you must seek in the world and so resurrect yourself and the world. And then there is the concept of karma closely linked to that of reincarnation. Are ye... As ye do unto others, shall it be done unto you, Yahshua says. As ye give, show, show shall it be given unto you. As ye judge others, so shall ye be judged. As ye serve others, so shall ye be served. Matthew chapter 7, verse 1. So, there you go, Bishop Larry Gators. Karma is mentioned in your Bible. Stop lying to your viewers. Bishop Larry Gators, I'm talking directly to you. I know what you've said about karma. And it's literally, you are gaslighting people. But I know you're a bad guy, so. I know you're, you're, uh, you're a bad guy. You know you're a bad guy. We all know you're a bad guy. Good guys don't make death threats on their YouTube channels. Good guys don't lie to people. So we all know. We all know you play for the dark cats. So. This is the belief that we would. This is the belief that what we do will come back to us, that our actions have consequences. Imagine what a difference it would make if people truly knew that when they cheat, they will be cheated on. When they kill, they will die by violence. When they are cruel, they will suffer in a similar fashion, whether in this life or the next. Yahshua expresses this again in the gospel of the Holy Twelve. One of my favorite gospels. We've gone through this 
on this channel before, a Christian manuscript written in Aramaic that was founded in a Buddhist monastery in Tibet. As you do in this life to your fellow creatures, so will be it be done to you in the lives to come. Yahshua also reminds us that he who lives by the sword dies by the, the by the sword. That's Matthew 26, 52. In the Gospel of the Holy Twelve, we also find the original account of the conversation between Yahshua and Nicodemus shortly before the crucifixion. Since most of us only know the edited version in the canonical Gospels, this version makes much more sense with the deleted passages back in place. Here, Nicodemus is asking Yahshua how a man might be born again. And a certain rabbi, Nicodemus, came unto him by night for fear of the Jews and said unto him, How can a man be born again when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Yahshua answered, Verily I say unto you, Except a man be born again of flesh and of spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and ye hear the sound thereof, but cannot tell whence it cometh or wh whether it goeth. The light shineth from the east, even unto the west. Out of the darkness the sun ariseth, and goeth down into the darkness again. So it is with man from ages unto ages. We keep coming back and reliving until we're ready, till we get it, till we're ready to graduate and go into the next state of consciousness. When he cometh from darkness, it is that he had liveth before. And when he goeth down again into darkness, it is that he may rest for a little while, and therefore again exist. As through many changes must ye be made perfect, as it is written in the book of Job, I am a wanderer, changing place after place and house after house, until I come into the city and the mansion which are eternal. And Nicodemus said unto him, How can these things be? And Joshua answered him and said unto him, Art thou a teacher in Israel? And understandeth not these things? Verily we speak that which we do not know, and bear witness to that which we have seen, and ye receive not our witness. If I have told you of earthly things, and ye not believed, how shall ye believe if I tell you of heavenly things? No man that ascended into heaven, but he that descended out of heaven, even the son daughter of man which is in heaven. In the Haman Gospel of the Christ, we read about Yahshua sitting with his disciples by the west of the temple when a group of mourners passed by carrying a body for funeral. The disciples ask, Master, if a man die, shall he live again? And Yahshua answers, saying, For them that have done evil, there is no rest. But they go out and in and suffer correction for ages till they are made perfect. But for them that have done good and attained unto perfection, there is endless rest, and they go into life everlasting. They rest in the eternal. Over them, the repeated cycles of death and birth have no power. For them with the wheel of the eternal resolves no more, for they have attained unto the, cre the center where eternal rest and where the center of all things is God. Sounds a lot like the Emerald Tablets to me, since we're reading the Emerald Tablets. Very familiar, does it not? Reincarnation in the early church. So how do these teachings get excised from our Bible, especially since they created a roadmap to enlightenment? Both karma and reincarnation teach the immortality of the soul and the importance of accountability for our actions. So the church believed they undercut the authority of the outside agencies that might bully us with threats of roasting and eternal fires of hell. Ding, 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 ding. This knowledge also has the power to alleviate the fear, guilt, and shame and hopelessness that has been used for centuries to force humanity into blind obedience. Religion, it is said, has two kinds of spiritual aspirants. Literalists, who take everything at face value, and es esotericists, who look below the surface meaning. In every religion of the world, the literalists constitute the fundamentalist. They strictly abide by the letter of the law, but often miss the spirit of truth that is in the heart of personal connection with the divine. It is this direct connection with the divine that brings enlightenment. So when an individual appears to stray from the rules and regulations of dogma, the fundamentalists use the law to punish, threaten, and judge others, creating massive division in families and nations, all in the name of the Prince of Peace. Yes, sister, yes. They have somehow forgotten that love, forgiveness, and non-judgment lie at the heart of all great spiritual teachers. Esoterists, on the other hand, seek to find the deeper meaning of the master's words. This method was used by Yahshua and the sages of the great mystery schools, who often taught in parable, using myth and symbols to trigger an inner gnosis in their students. This method allows each of us to figure out our own level of understanding, permitting the process of inner revelation to awaken the student. 
In the early years of the Christian movement, both of these approaches could be found in Christianity. The esoteric approach lives with the Gnostics, while the literal approach can be found in Roman Catholic Church. Some early church fathers were literalists, including Irenaeus, Tertullian, Epiphanius, and even St. Jerome. You can tell I grew up Protestant because we all talk about these church fathers in the Protestant church. We have no saints in the Protestant church. These men wanted doctrines that could be nailed down and codified and left nothing to outside interpretation. To create this structure, they made lots of rules and regulations. Gnostics, by contrast, were involved in the ever-changing process of personal revelation and spiritual discovery. We can begin to see the difference in these two approaches when it comes to resurrection. Esoterics understood that Yasha was, was talking about the resurrection of the spirit as it comes and goes throughout the ages in various bodies, but literalists thought that the dead body not the spirit would be reanimated which is the whole point of human suffering according to the yoga sutras confusing your body thinking your body is who you are when that's laughable your body isn't who you are it's just the outfit you're wearing today for this life it's your soul that's eternal gnostics understood that the spiritual resurrection is the awakening of the soul as it breaks free from the confines of the ego while the physical res resurrection is the return of the soul to a new body or incarnation, Yahshua speaks about this in the human gospel as he differentiates between the resurrection of the body and the soul. There is a resurrection from the body and there is a resurrection in the body. There is a raising out of the life of flesh, our deaths, and there is a falling into the light of flesh, our rebirths. The body that ye lay in the grave or that is consumed by fire is not the body that shall be, but they who come are reborn shall receive other bodies yet their own and as they have sown in one life shall they reap in another blessed are they who have worked righteousness in this life for they shall receive the crown of life literal interpreters of this doctrine however claim that the resurrection meant that millions of people would have their dead bodies reanimated since most of these bodies have been trapped in coffins for years and bombed autopsies are even burned this does not make sense nope but the deeper meaning of resurrection was not explained to church members. So the concept of resurrection has been misunderstood for centuries. Resurrection of the body is essentially the doctrine of reincarnation. We die and then we are reborn. The church went along with this misunderstanding since the promise of eternal life was a powerful draw to many. Intrinsic to this premise was Yahshua's own resurrection, the story of Lazarus rising bodily from the tomb. However, this resurrection happened only after three days, not several hundred years. The spiritual process that allows human beings to sustain his physical body indefinitely were taught at the highest levels of the mystery schools, yet few could attain such a state. These sages knew that eternal life was not to be found in a potion, magic stone, or supernatural elixir, nor was it something that the ego-based individual could acquire. While there is an ample evidence that there have long been masters who have maintained their physical bodies for centuries, this is not something that the average person would even want to attempt because it requires decades of rigorous discipline. The banishment of reincarnation from church teachings. Erasing reincarnation from Christian theology began with the splitting of the Orthodox Church into two major divisions. The Western Church was run by the Roman Emperor and the Pope in Rome, while the Eastern Church was run by the Emperor in Constantinople, modern-day Istanbul. Each of these emperors had the power to dictate church policy as they pleased, and they came together about once every hundred years in a council to review and to determine church doc doctrine. In the 6th century, the Emperor Just Justinian, who ruled Rome from 527 to 567 CE, decided that he wanted to remove reincarnation from ch their church theology, but the Roman bishops opposed this. However, Justinian, who was the most aggressive Roman emperor since, Con since Constantine in terms of meddling with theological doctrine, tried to forcibly compel this change. He imprisoned the Western Pope for four long years, but eventually Pope Vigilius escaped. In retaliation, Justinian convened the fifth ecumenical church council held in Constantinople at the huge Hagi Sophia church in May of 553 CE. The emperor's intention was to force the church to adopt new policies and to do this he appointed his own bishops and issues edicts telling them how to vote. 
He then invited 159 of his own eastern bishops to his conclave and only six of the western ones, pushing through 15 separate policies that were in opposition to Yahshua's original teaching. So corrupt. Reminds us of our politics we see today. Very corrupt. Just change the votes how you want to change them. And there you go. You got what you want. He also declared that anyone who did not obey his edicts would be excommunicated. The first edict read, if anyone asserts the fabulous preexistence of souls and shall assert the monstrous restoration which follows from it, let him be an anatheum. Here the word anatheum means damned. While the word restoration refers to the spiritual restoration of the soul in its original union with God through reincarnation and teaching of union that lay at the heart of Yahshua's message. Pope v Vigilius protested this council, demanding equal representation between the Eastern and Western bishops. Not only did Justinian ignore him, but he also persecuted the Pope, even trying to kill him. Today, the Catholic Encyclopedia states that, the, that this council was illegal. And thus, its conclusion should not be regarded as church decree, but the damage has been done. And today, many Christians do not realize that reincarnation was every part of Christian theology. Thus, the teachings of Jesus became corrupt, defiled, and hidden by men of no true mastery. The initiatic wisdom of Christ was silenced, and the true path of enlightenment that Jesus or Yahshua taught was forced to go underground. In time, the rift between these two branches of church grew even more greater until in 1054, each branch excommunicated the other. The Western Church became the Roman Catholic, while the Eastern Orthodox Church formulated its own approaches. Today, the Eastern Orthodox branch does not even consider the Pope its spiritual leader. Well, no one should consider this to consider the Pope its spiritual leader, in all fairness. So, all right, you guys, I have to admit something to you. I actually just broke the recording so I could have some lunch. My food was delivered, and while I was eating my vegetarian sandwich, I was watching reruns of the reality show Family Karma that I love. Family Karma... Um, quenches my longing to be back in india because it's about all these indian families in miami and the episode i was watching where one of the sons is gay and of course in hindu culture especially very religious families it's a hard su subject and one of the care one of the guy the guy who's not a character he's a real person had to go tell his very old indian grandmother that he was gay and that he was going to be marrying a a man and um i just got really emotional watching it it was such a beautiful scene to see the love and to hear the grandmother say, well, if you're happy, I'm happy. So I had to go, getting emotional again, I had to go touch my makeup up. I have invested now in waterproof eyeliner and mascara. So hopefully it won't, it didn't run. But but uh, I'm a very sensitive person. I get very emotional. It's my Scorpio moon. So if you see my makeup a little bit messed up, that's why. But nonetheless, we continue. Reincarnation in the 21st century. In modern times, hundreds of hypnotherapists, physicians, and researchers have continued to explore the concept of reincarnation in past lives through hypnotherapy. As a professional hypnotherapist and clairvoyant of 25 years, I have seen the reincar re reincarnational patterns of many clients played out lifetime after lifetime, reflecting the deeper themes of courage, love, power, learning, and compassion. Our soul Histories are woven through the centuries like unbroken ribbons as we continue to work through lessons after lesson until we finally achieve a level of mastery. Yeah, and that's what a lot of Dr. Wise's books are about that I was telling you guys about. I'll put a link to Many Minds, Many Masters down in the description box below for you guys because he was a therapist and through hypnotherapy, he learned how to do hypnotherapy and he wasn't doing hypnotherapy for past life regression. It was simply for like helping people with you know, quitting smoking or issues they have in this life. And, and, and through it, he discovered people were going back into past lives. And his books are amazing. His books are absolutely amazing. So I will link him down below for you guys as well. If this is a new topic for you, this topic of reincarnation. Seminal among those who have brought these teachings to light are... Some, okay, she's talking about him now. So I think I said David Weiss earlier, which is the flat earth guy. Sorry, it's Brian Weiss. Sorry, David. Sorry, Brian. It's Dr. Brian Wise. So let me let me say this again. Seminal among those who have brought these teachings to light in the modern world are Dr. Brian Weiss, Dr. Michael Newton, and Dr. Bruce Goldberg, all professionally trained psychiatrists. Dr. Weiss first stumbled on reincarnation 
reincarnation while treating a patient who had resisted all other forms of therapy. So like I was saying, he accidentally stumbled upon, this is the exact guy I was just talking about. He ac she accidentally stumbled upon this through hypno sessions with his, his um, patients. By going to the root of a particular memory locked in the patient's past life records, his client's problems were resolved. Dr. Weiss's books are cornerstones in the field of past life research. Dr. Newton has catapulted into a 20-year study of in-between life states of hundreds of clients, authoring the groundbreaking books, Journey of the Soul and the Destiny of Souls, classic in understanding the mechanics of our journey to and from the heavenly worlds. Dr. Goldberg has written some 17 books on the subject of past and future lifetimes and specialized in helping people connect with their higher selves through past life regressions. And Dr. Weiss also, as, as well as I'm assuming Dr. Goldberg and Dr. Newton, some of Dr. Weiss's books are about future lives too, because he can get people into hypnotic states where they can see the, the path they can pick depending on what they correct in this life, like what is going to unfold in the next existence. That is very, that's fascinating as well. Very fascinating. So the client actually could see in hypnotic session, the different selections they're going to have depending on what they actually take care of in this life. Yeah. And I think if we all knew what karma we needed, we would carry over to a next existence. If we, if we could see that, if we could see what our lives look like in the next life, if we don't work on ourselves in this life versus what our lives would look like in the next life, if we do work on ourselves, it would be more of an incentive to actually work on ourselves, right? Dolores Cannon, author of some 17 books about her client's past life memories, is equally as impressive, not only for the qu quantity of her contact content, but for the quality in terms of the sheer level of detail she conveys. Much of her work can be corroborated by known events in history, and dovetails perfectly with research conducted by hypnotherapist team of Stuart Wilson and Joanne uh, Prentice in England. Both of these resources have found multiple individuals who have incarnated as the scenes around the time of Yahshua and Magdalene. They have been able to relate in detail the events, beliefs, and teachings of Yahshua, Magdalene, and the Essenes, as well as the information about their training in other lands. All three authors' books also include detailed information about Essene doctrine, which focuses on the mother, mother, father, God teachings that were later excised from our Bible. And I want to, I have a memory of my life with Magdalene too in that lifetime. And I actually, I won't say who I was to her, but I was older than her. And I had, I was part of not her training per se, but I was definitely an authority in her life. And that makes a lot of sense when I, when I regressed to that and realized that that's why the teachings of the yoga sutras came so naturally to me, because we know that Magdalene also studied in India too. She followed along some of her, she was a protege of people that had also done that. So I realized that's why I, my courses always sell out. That's why it all comes very naturally to me because I'd done this before. I'd done this before and I'd actually been a teacher, one of Magdalene's influences. Different, I can't say how that, one day I'll talk more about that, but but yeah. So I, I get that, I get what they're saying for sure. Kindness to animals. Let's turn now to Yahshua's beautiful teachings about animals. In the Gospel of the Holy Twelve, we discover several chapters having to do with Yahshua's admonitions to treat animals in a more loving and humane way. One of these stories chronicles how Yahshua saves a horse from being beat to death. In another, Yahshua saves a camel who was overladen with goods from a cruel master. And in the third story, Yahshua rescues a cat from being tortured by some boys for fun. Sorry, I get emotional because, yeah, in the, in the Gospel of Holy Twelve, that was almost every chapter he was so loving towards animals. And he demanded that his students be vegetarian. And that if you, he says it at the end of the Gospel of the Holy Twelve, if you want to maintain spiritual enlightenment, then you cannot, absolutely 100% cannot eat meat. You just can't. And the story of the cat, yeah, he rescues the cat and the cat en ends up traveling around with them it becomes kind of like part of their entourage and he says multiple things in the gospel of the holy 12 he says do the do the animals not breathe the same air you breathe like why on god's green earth do you think that your life is more valuable than that of an animal's it's not your life is not more valuable than that of an animal's hence why mr t 
one of the first things he did when he was in office is he met made animal cruelty a felony. If you didn't know that, look it up. He made animal cruelty a felony, a federal felony. Because as Joshua says, do the animals not breathe the same air you breathe? Are the animals not your brothers and your sisters? God knows every hair on your dog's head, just like he knows every hair on your head. Our animals are not our pets. They're our family members. They're absolute. My dog, Ravi, is my family member. He's treated like a family member, not by just me, but by my extended family as well, by my parents. Ravi gets Christmas presents from my parents. Usually bones, but he's part of the family. Our animals are part of our family. We hurt when they hurt. So I'm hoping that this will be something for people to contemplate. Um, you know, I, I've said many times before, I'm never going to force someone to be a vegetarian. I have many people in my life who are not vegetarians that I love. It's your choice. But I know from our historical research that what we've been told about our ancestors simply isn't true. Our ancestors were not meat eaters. Our ancestors, the Atlanteans, did not eat meat. They knew better than that. And we think about what's in meat. Well, blood's in meat. What happens when they slaughter animals? They terrorize them. What happens to the blood when it's terrorized? That is what you are ingesting. Just something to think about. All right. In each of these cases, Yahshua heals the animal and tries to bring enlightenment to the human abuser. Be ye therefore considerate, be tender, be pitiful, be kind, not to your own kind alone, but to every creature which, which is within your care. For ye are to them as gods, to whom they look in their need. In the New Testament, there is a scene in the temple when Jesus loses his temper and frees the animals being held for sacrifice by the priests. Exactly. That's actually when we see Jesus upset at the temple for the quote unquote merchants. It's not necessarily the business that's being taking place that he's pissed about. It's the animal sacrifices that he's pissed about. That's why he's whipping people is because they're going to be sacrificing animals. However, there were once more than these kind of. However, there were once more of these kinds of stories in the Gospels. In one account we find in the Gospel of the Holy Twelve, Yahshua rescues a stray cat, putting her inside his garment. She lay in his bosom. He sets food and drink before the cat and gives her to a widow named Lorenza to be cared for. Some of the people said, This man careth for all creatures. Are they his brothers and his sisters that he should love them? In this section of the Gospel of the Holy Twelve, which was cut out of our original Bible, Yahshua goes on to explain about the nature of animals. Verily, these are your fellow creatures of the great household of God. Ye, they are your brethren and your sisters. As I said, he says, are they not your brothers and your sisters? Having the same breath of life in the eternal, and whosoever careth for one of the least of these, and giveth it to eat and drink in its need, the same doeth unto me. So how you treat animals is how you treat God. Are you hunting animals? Are you killing animals? Are you eating animals? That's how you treat God. And those who willingly suffer one of these to be in want, and defineth it will not even evilly entereth. Suffereth the evil as done unto me, as you have done in this life, and shall it be done unto you in the life to come. So how you treat animals in this life, that's karma building up for you in the next life. At another time, the disciples tell Jesus of a man who is tormenting animals for profit, just as today people cruelly use dogs and roosters for dog fights and cock fights. Yahshua tells them, Verily I say unto you, they who partake of benefits which are, are gotten by wronging one of God's creatures cannot be righteous, nor can they touch holy things or teach the mysteries of the kingdom whose hands are stained with blood or whose mouths are defiled with flesh. Whoever I say unto all who desireth to be my disciples, keep your hands from bloodshed and let no flesh meat enter your mouths. For God is just and bountiful, who ordaineth that man shall live by the fruits and the seeds of the earth alone. 
But if any animal suffer greatly, and if its life be misery unto it, or if it be dangerous to you, release it from its life quickly and with as little pain as you can. So there's an animal that's dying in pain, put it out of his misery. That is your kindness you can do for it. Send it forth in love and mercy, but torment it not. And God, the Father, Mother, will show you mercy unto you as ye have shown mercy unto those who given into your hands. Finally, there's a wonderful story about Yahshua saving a lion that has been hunted by a group of men with stones and javelins. And Jesus rebuked them, saying, Why hunt ye these creatures of God, which are more noble than you? Did you all hear that? These animals are more noble than we are. Let me reread that again. And Jesus rebuked them, saying, Why ye, why hunt ye these creatures of God, which are more noble than you? By the cruelties of many generations, those were made the enemies of man, which should have been his friend. If the power of God is shown in them, and also are shown his long suffering and compassion, cease ye to persecute this creature, who desireth not to harm you. See ye not how he fleeth from you, and is terrified by your violence. And the lion came and lay at the feet of Yahshua and showed love to him. And the people were astonished and said, Lo, this man loveth all creatures and hath power to command even the beasts from the deserts. And they obeyed him. It is great tragedy that these te teachings were taken out of the Bible. Imagine what a different world it would be today if we actually lived by these codes of kindness. However, it is clear then neither the Roman emperor nor the Jews wanted to give up their taste for eating meat making blood sacrifice to re to respective gods or engaging in the killing sports of the Roman Colosseums. So these teachings were edited out of the Bible. And I just want to mention in the Gospel of the Holy Twelve, when in the Bible that we have today, it talks about how God, our Jesus, multiplied the fish and the bread. That was an edit. It was the grapes and the bread. He never ate meat. Never. Never. So I would ask your pastors today why the hell churches are serving fried chicken and steak at their and barbecue at their community events when the, the person they claim to worship said absolutely not. Should you ever touch these things? The violence you are promoting when you serve meat in your churches is the violence that waits for you in the next life. That's what Yahshua said in the missing gospels. Ask your pastor why they are disobeying the commandments of the Christ they claim to worship. On the subject of animal sacrifice, Jesus warns, no blood offering of beast or bird or man can take away sin. For how can the consequence be purged from sin by the shedding of innocent blood? Nay, it will increase the, con the condemnation. So if you're doing animal sacrifices or human sacrificing sacrifices, and I know, I know for a fact that they, that 90% of the truth, truthers that are infiltrated, a few of them, some of them that you guys really seem to like are actually, actually do participate in human and animal sacrifice. I know that for a fact. So all those truthers out there that are infiltrators, that are being paid by the three letter agencies that are doing black magic, shedding the blood of innocence, your condemnation is waiting for you in the next life. Get ready. If we are willing to consider that same spark of light that lives with each of us also lives within the animals, we must ask ourselves, what right do we have to torture or kill our fellow creatures? The same spark of light that lives within you lives within the squirrels and the birds and the dogs, the cats, the horses, the elephants, all those animals carry the same fractal of God that is in you and in your children and in your parents. We need to start waking up to this. We really, really do. I know people, oh, I need meat, I crave meat. No, you crave the blood. You crave the adrenalized, you know, blood. That's what you're craving. So just, if you wanna go vegetarian, Go vegetarian i promise you the cravings will go you will feel so much better i have not had meat since i was 14 years old i'm almost 40. the idea of us being pro protein deficient is programming there is more protein in spinach than there is in any meat do your research god provides us with everything we need in the fruits and the vegetables and the grains 
80% of India is vegetarian because they're Hindu and in the Hindu faith, you don't eat meat. And a lot of Indians, like my teacher's teacher lived to be over a hundred. Krishmacharya lived to be over a hundred. They live to ripe old ages. Like, hello. Meat is not even that good for you. You're karmically having the consequences of meat even in this life. This is really something to ponder and think about. Let's now turn to the erasing of the Divine Mother from the Christian teachings. We have already had a glimpse of how the goddess was lost in Jewish history, but let us now discover what Yahshua actually taught about the Divine Feminine. For it was this imbalance that the Master sought to restore in the highly patriarchal world in which he lived. 